Our scripture reading is also from the Gospel according to John, chapter 6. We'll be reading verses 25 through 51. John, chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee that thou doest the work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me, and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat and thereof may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. We open now God's word to John chapter 6, as we hope to consider especially Verse 35, in this whole context of this sermon of the Lord Jesus, in which he declared himself to be the bread of life. John 6, verse 35, Jesus said to the people who assembled around him, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And boys and girls, you'll remember that this this whole conversation came after that very well-known event where 
Jesus had been preaching to the multitudes. It was starting to get late. And Christ felt a compassion for the people. It was, it was late and they, they would have to travel. Many people had come from far. They would be hungry. Jesus wanted to serve them some food. And He talked to His disciples about it. They were, they were somewhat um, not knowing how they could ever feed such a multitude. They had five loaves of barley and they have two small fish. The Lord Jesus went ahead and blessed that and thanked the Lord for that. And as, as He parted that and gave it to the disciples, and as they started to give what they had to the multitude, they were astonished to see that they were able to feed more than 5,000 people. And remember, there was so much food, even left over, that they were able to fill 12 baskets with all the fragments. And the people took notice that a miracle had happened. They, they realized something majestic was there. They, they were able to say that prophet that should come into the world was who this Jesus was. And they were ready to crown Him as their King. Well, the very next day, this crowd met with Jesus again and they started a conversation with Him and it led to this one I am statement of the Lord Jesus that He is the bread of life. He, he was obviously connecting now this whole discourse with that miracle where they all were fed by the Lord Jesus in their minds they're wanting more food and they're wanting Him as their King because he, he gives them what they need. They're thinking in earthly terms. They're thinking in, in having um, Israel's independence back. But the Lord Jesus, instead of giving what they want, He gives what they need. And this, this statement, the, the main part of this statement is Christ's identity. He he is saying He is the bread of life. And connected with that identity, He gives us four ways by which we can be what we could say associated with Christ. These are four words that help us know how to have an allegiance to Christ. Other ways to express this is how to receive Christ. How, how to accept the Lord Jesus. And and these four words are, are to come, to eat, to believe, and to drink. And, and it's interesting to, to evaluate all of these words. This is what our first point we'll, we'll be looking at. Coming to Jesus. And we'll, we'll, it will flow from there that coming to Jesus will understand that by the words He uses, we can be nurtured by Jesus. That's our second point. And as food is known to do, it brings you satisfaction, a sense of sufficiency. And so our third point will be being satisfied in Jesus. But looking at those four words, to come, to eat, to believe, and to drink, now two of those are purely figurative. Boys and girls, remember that, that is how Jesus, in many ways, is speaking directly to the younger ones of us, to little children, to young people. This is a picture inside the Bible. Even though you see a lot of words, and the Bible does not come with pictures as we known pictures to be, as we know them to be, we, we have words that form pictures. And Jesus is using these pictures, identifying Himself with bread, that we eat, and something that we would drink. Later, he'll even say it's his blood that we are to drink. Those are two pictures, but then one is a direct and straightforward connotation. It's very objective. It's the coming. We all understand what it means to come when someone asks us. And then the other word is what we could say the overarching Principle. It is, it is the word that we speak of so often in, in, in teaching the Bible, the word faith, the word believe. And it's really the overarching word because all these other words explain what faith is. If faith to our minds is subjective because it's not something we can touch, it's not something we can show a picture of, well then Jesus gives us pictures. And he gives us explanations. Well, he says he's going to teach us that to believe in Jesus is the same as coming to Jesus. 
And if you need more help, it is the same as eating Him. It is the same as drinking from Him. And so this is our first point. Let us, let us look at each one of those um, first. We'll look at coming itself. The, the act of coming. For you to have an allegiance to Christ. For you to be saved by Christ. You must come to Christ. And immediately, as soon as I say this, see, the, the one reason why some of these things are so um, misunderstood by people has a lot to do with how simple it actually is and people only complicate it. It is very simple. But even as we look at the simplicity, you'll notice it'll be ministering to your soul. Um, every single one of us know what it means to come. Both because we hear people asking us to go where they are asking us, come. And we are also on the side of asking others to come. Little children, how many times you hear your parents asking you to come? Come, it's time for dinner. Or come, um, I must show you something. Come, get in the car. We, we must go to the store together. Or dad, could you come here? I need you. Or mom, could you come? I finished. Is, is this okay? And, and we all know that the fulfillment of that come is when we are by the very side or very close to, to the person who asked us to come. If you, if you are the young person who says, Mom, I finished the chore, could you come and see what you think? You will not be satisfied if from the living room she says, it's all right, you, you want her to see it. So if you said come... In your mind, the fulfillment of that command will be once your mom is right there beside you and you can show what you did because you asked her to come. And in your mind, the fulfillment of that coming is when you see her beside you. And little children, that's the same for when your parents say come. You're not supposed to stay in the room and in the distance that you are. You're supposed to walk in the direction of your mom and your dad. And, and that command will be fulfilled once you're right there at the very presence of your father or mother that bids you to come. And so let's think of coming in a, in a slow motion kind of way. It begins where you hear the command to come, but then the ear is attuned with the heart and there's a desire in the heart that you would begin to comply. And as you, as you then know in your mind, okay, someone's calling me to come in the next room. Well, you need to take steps in that direction and you will take as many steps as it takes to be right beside that person who asked you to come. And so we have Christ here saying, come to me. Come to me. That will be fulfilled when you're beside Christ. When you are hearing Christ. When you are listening to Jesus. Not when you're far. Not when you never speak to him. Not when you never open the Bible. Not when you don't come to church. Not when you don't really know even who He is. You see, when Jesus says, come to me, He's inviting you close. He wants you beside Him. He wants you like Mary who will sit at His feet and choose that which is best, the better portion. He doesn't want someone busy for Him who never talks to Him. Or never listens to Him. He wants you to come to Him. But who is He? See, this is, this is the one thing. There are many people who say, I have come to Christ and I believe in Christ. But when they start describing who that Jesus is they believe, it's not really the Jesus of Scripture. So they have not come to Jesus. They have come to another fictional Jesus. That can happen as well. And, and, and this is... One key thing that happens, there are many people disappointed with Jesus. They say they have tried Jesus. They have not liked it, but they have not met the true one. So they're not really disappointed with the, the, the true Jesus because they really haven't met him yet. But in their minds, they think they did. And so they have this, this evaluation. 
Who is the Jesus that you believe in? Is He merciful and compassionate? Is that the Jesus you have gone to? See, if you believe in a Jesus who is all wrath but no love, even if you think of God the Father, if you have come to a God who is all wrath but He is no love, this is not the Jesus who is bidding you to come. And if you believe in a Jesus who is all love but no wrath, a God who is all good and no justice, no righteousness, then that is not the true Jesus or the true God the Father. If you believe in a Jesus who is divine but is not human, or a Jesus who is human but not divine, that is not the true Jesus. They have not come to Him. So in the coming, you need to understand that you are to come to the true Jesus. Imagine, imagine a father who says, come to me, but that child thinks it's someone in another room calling him, so the child goes to that other person. Well, that child has not come to the right person, even though he went somewhere. That, that's a lot of what's happening in a lot of false religion who even uses the name of Jesus they say they believe in Jesus, but it's a false one. So you have come, you have to come to the true Jesus, who is human, who is divine, who is loving, who is just, who is kind and compassionate. And so it has a lot to do with coming to him where you will find him and you will find him in his word. Um, you can't say you have come to Jesus if you never open the Bible to hear Jesus speak to you. Or you, you come perhaps to church, but do you come with this heart, I, I want to come and hear Christ teach me and minister to me. And then there are those who do not want to go to church where Jesus will be found. Think of how emphatic this is. Jesus has said that He is the the head of the body, and the church is the body of Christ. Someone who says, who is unwilling to come to church, they are literally saying they despise the body. How can you love the head and not the body? Because the body is the body of Christ. How can you say you love the bridegroom, but not love the bride? And so coming to church and being with God's people has a lot to do with Obeying this command, come to me. Because it is in church that you will find him, that you will hear about him, that you will learn who the true Jesus is to come to the true Jesus. Um, Spurgeon, um, he says this re regarding this whole concept of coming to Jesus. He says, the coming here meant is performed by desire, by prayer, by assent, by consent, by trust, by obedience. See, the coming is, is, a, is a summary of what faith is. It means that I hear what Christ is and learn what God says He is, that He is God and that He is man, that He came into the world to take the sins of men unto Himself and to be punished in their place. I hear all this and assent to it. I believe in Jesus and I say, if He died for all those who trust Him, I will trust Him. If He has offered so great a sacrifice upon the tree for guilty men, I will rely upon that sacrifice and make it the basis of my hope. That is coming to Jesus Christ. And then um, Spurgeon gives the illustration of Charles um, Wesley. Um, it is said that, um, the inspiration for composing one of his hymns was a day that he was in his room and his window opened to, to the sea and there was a lot of wind and a storm and a little bird found its way into his room and ended up sitting on his lap and stayed there while the storm was outside. And afterwards, um, Charles Wesley, of course, was very, very... Um, happy to see how, how content that little bird was to be safe on his lap during the storm. But after the storm was gone, he, he ushered the little bird back out. And this is what's believed to have been what encouraged him to say these words of a well-known hymn. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly while the raging billows roll, while the tempest still is high. 
Hide me, O oh, my Savior, hide me, till the storm of life is past. See, um, young people, boys and girls, that little bird needed to go somewhere safe, and, and, and it came to the very lap of Charles Wesley. And, and this, is, this is what we need to do. We need to come to the Lord Jesus, and we need to come to where he will be found. And this is where we can apply in, in a precious way about the Lord's Supper. Um, when we come to the Lord's Supper, and, 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 and I do believe it's akin to coming to church. We, we need to be careful not to think that the presence of Christ is, is more at the Lord's Supper than it is as, at a worship service. Jesus himself said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. This is what I mean, that when you come to church, if you go to a prayer meeting, if you go to a little Bible study, there will be the presence of Christ there. And Jesus said, come to me. And so we know where he is to be found. He is to be found in the word when you read it by your own. He is to be found in a Bible study, a prayer meeting, and worship service. He is to be found at the Lord's Supper. At the Lord's Supper, the way some of the Reformers would express, it's, it's not that He's more there than, than at other times. You, you might experience Him there more than at other times. And so, the Lord's Supper is next Lord's Day. And the Lord Jesus is the one who's invited us to come. Boys and girls, remember this um, week you had one of the parables of that invitation to the great feast. And... There were those who didn't want to come. See, they were invited to come. It's a lot like Jesus is saying, come to me. Eat of me. Well, in that parable, remember, the king invited many people to come. But there were those giving the excuses. They had better things to do. They wanted to go to see their oxen. They wanted to go to see their land or go and be with their bride, whom they had just, one whom had just gotten married. Instead of coming to the banquet of the king. And the king wanted so much that people would come that he went and sent people everywhere to invite people to come. Well, next Lord's Day, we will have the Lord's Supper and everyone who has professed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is invited to come. And always remember this, even if you have not yet professed your faith, that Lord's Supper is inviting you to come. And then there's a procedure, right? You, will, you need to come and profess your faith. You need to come and talk to the elders, talk to your parents. Um, Mom, when is it that I could profess my faith? Do you think I should profess my faith? Do you believe I have faith? Young people, talk like that to your parents. The confession of faith before God and before the congregation is not something you should be um, shy about, especially with your family. Talk about it. Parents, be honest and, and encourage them. Pray for them as they grow up to see this precious day in which they can profess their faith. And then once they have professed their faith, to, to then come around the table. Come. Be like that little bird. Because there's a storm out there. And there's a storm in here. Sin is like a big storm in our hearts. And we will only find comfort and salvation and deliverance if we come to the very bosom of Christ. So come where He can be found. Now, let's look at our, at our second um, word. Come. Now let us look at believe. Believe. You must believe in Jesus. Well, let us talk about the act of believing because this is central to this whole text. This is what the word come is explaining. This is what the word eating and drinking is explaining. It's the word faith. Now, let, let's put a few things together. We, we, we have often seen um, these parts of of faith, but it really helps us to see these parts of faith with the thought of coming and the thought of eating and drinking. Remember that faith is knowledge. You need to have knowledge. You cannot believe something you do not know. If you're, if you're um, about to fall from a cliff, but there's a rock hanging, uh, not a rock, but a rope that is hanging, if you don't know that rope is anywhere to be found, it will not save you. So you need to have a knowledge of that rope. 
And a lot of people, when they try to say that faith isn't just knowledge, it seems to minimize knowledge. But you never minimize knowledge because it starts with knowledge. It is essential. This is what missionaries do. They, they go to a foreign land to give knowledge to a people that there is a Christ. They will never trust in Him until they have that knowledge. But that knowledge has to be a certain kind of knowledge. Now you know how there's that passage that speaks of how the demons also believe and tremble? That knowledge the demons have is not the same kind of knowledge that is the beginning of faith. Some problem also in people's conception is when they hear that verse, they say, well, all I have is a knowledge of Christ. It's the same knowledge that demons have, and that will not save me. No, it's not. Unless your knowledge is like the knowledge of the devils. The knowledge of the devils is an evil, negative knowledge. Everything they knew of Christ, they would hate Christ with it. They heard of His compassion, they mocked it. They, they heard of His miracles. Take, take this miracles. The, the demons, they were seeing this miracle that would ha was happening, and they knew it's because He was God. They knew He could create bread, and they, He could create fish, and they hated everything about it. And the Pharisees were a good picture of who the demons are. Remember, the Pharisees would see that man born blind. Oh, he can now see? Oh, he was healed on the Sabbath day? I hate it. That's who the demons are. See, everything they find out about Jesus or know, they don't like it. So that knowledge is not the same knowledge of one who has a heart of faith. You learn, take, take VBS. There were five wonderful parables as you were told those parables. And teachers, as you were teaching those parables, as we reviewed those parables, weren't our hearts loving that knowledge, liking that knowledge, wanting to build upon that knowledge. That's the knowledge that is faith. It is a loving knowledge. And then the third thing, so knowledge, loving knowledge, and then a trusting knowledge. Trust is, is always that word that really, that, that really puts faith all together in what it is. It's not just a knowledge that you know. It's not just a knowledge that you love. Even, even there, right, you do meet people who love a lot of things about Jesus. They would never be like, like devils who would be angry at the things they're learning. No, they, they love a lot of things. And they might be hazy about other things, but they do love the compassion and the mercy and the, and the miracles of Christ. But are they trusting Christ? Are they putting their confidence in Christ? And, and that is... Um, what, what we could say the very central part. Knowledge and the love of, of, of loving knowledge is like the foundation of faith and trust is like the very nucleus of faith. It's the very central part of faith. Synonyms would be confidence, um, conviction, or you could say to repose. Think of a chair that you trust and so you repose your weight upon it. You are trusting it. You're leaning upon it. And so as you know Jesus, you love what you're learning, and then you trust Him. You find out that He's a Savior of sinners. You then acknowledge, so my sins, I can safely put them upon Jesus, and I can trust that He will pardon me of all my sins. And you realize, I have, a, I have a lack of righteousness, but He has a righteousness that God's Word says that it's given me by faith. Well, I will trust that. I will not try to achieve my own righteousness. I will trust His and be thankful and satisfied in it. That is trust. And so that is, we've, we've looked at coming, we've looked at belief. Now let us look at eating and drinking. And, and this is what leads us to, to our second point of nurtured by Jesus. Because that's what eating and drinking does. It, it nurtures you. It feeds you. It gives you, it gives you, you eat a meal and you drink a good healthy drink and you, you feel strengthened. Eating and drinking of Jesus. Let, let us look at this act of eating and drinking. Jesus, and these are the key words that, that really identify or connect with, with who he said he is. I am the bread of life. And he doesn't just give a figure of himself as the bread of life. He says what we are to do because he is the bread of life. We are to eat it. We are to eat him. We are to consume him. 
This is what the Lord Jesus keeps, keeps developing. In verse 49, he says, I am that bread of life. He, he's referring to the manna. Remember how the manna fell in the days of Moses, but it never gave them eternal life. All those people who ate that manna died. But Jesus is saying, I have come from heaven. If you eat of me, you will live. So then he starts calling himself the bread of life because it gives life for whoever eats of Christ. Now notice, I said how all of them connect each other. If, if you don't think, there, if you have no knowledge that there's food in a certain place, you won't go to that place. And if you have knowledge, but you don't love the knowledge, because let's say you hear that there's a certain food and you don't like that food. You see how important it is to have knowledge and to love that knowledge? And all of us know what it means to know about a food that we don't like. So we have the knowledge, but we don't have the love. So we don't go sit down or we avoid that dinner. But the moment we know it and we love it and we know that food can give us what we need. We sit down and we eat. Now, i, I I think I did say this before, and maybe you've heard it elsewhere. Every time you sit, do you know that is a profession of faith? Because you are trusting that food to give you what you need. And you need life. We're not thinking ultimately of life. We're usually thinking, I'm hungry. You do start feeling weak, so you think, I need strength. Your mind might be foggy because it's been so many hours without certain calories. And so you, you want that to be fulfilled. But ultimately, of course, it's life. Because if you don't eat for X amount of days or drink water, you will die. And so when we sit to eat, we're, we're confessing our trust that that food will deliver what, what it promises. It will give you nurture. It will give you strength. And so when you eat it, you are trusting it. And this is what Jesus is saying. Be nurtured by me. Eat of me. Drink of me. Have your life come out of me. And beloved, this explains why many Christians are weak. It is because they're not eating and drinking of Christ sufficiently. It, this is really how simple it is. If, if you want to understand a spiritual condition, well, apply it to the physical end. If you are weak in your spiritual life and you're still not understanding that it has to do with lack of Christ, well, stay three days without eating. And, and the moment you realize, I need food, let it be a sermon to you, I need Christ. Because your soul will not be fed by food at the table. Your soul will be fed by Christ. He's the one who said, I am the bread of life. And notice what he nurtures you with. It's, it's interesting that what Jesus does is he, he goes immediately to that which matters most. And he, he bypasses elsewhere in Scripture. We know what all is here in between. Well, when you are in Christ, you will have more joy. You will have more peace. You will have more patience. You will be more content. You will be holier. You will be patient. You will be full of gratitude. You, you will be someone who, who will be good and kind. And those are all very nurturing things for the soul. And, and think of someone who's eating his, his rice and beans and, and potatoes and, and meat and salad. Well, he will see well, his hair will grow well, the complexion will be nice, he will be more cheerful, he will be more strong, and he will have life. Well, if you go to Christ, and you read your Bible, and you go to family worship, and you go to prayer meetings, and you come to Sunday worship, and you come to Sunday worship in the morning, and you come to Sunday worship in the afternoon, and you find out of a Bible study, and you join it, and you find out of a ladies' Bible study, and you join it, because you want to be with Jesus, and you want to be fed with Jesus, and there is never an excess. 
If you eat too much food, it can be an excess. If you come to Christ and do as many Bible studies as you can and still be able to work and take care of your family and be praying in all the meals, you will be so full of life. So not only all of these complexions, think of joy, think of happiness, think of goodness, think of kindness, as all those things I mentioned as having good sight and a hair that is growing well. But Jesus doesn't say all these things. He goes to the very end. And that's what leads us to our third point, being satisfied in Jesus, because this is what gives true satisfaction and it ends all your pursuits. Jesus says basically um, three things that are the essential that he provides. He says, in the last day, you will rise again. And you will have eternal life. And this, of course, means you have eternal bliss. He goes right to those three. You will have life. You will be raised in the last day. Did you notice as we read how he kept repeating this? And if, if I were to read verses 53 through 58, he will repeat it. But look at 54. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. See, he goes to the ultimate of life. All of these things are true. If, you, if you're feeding in Jesus, you'll be happier. You'll be more joyful. You'll be more content. If you notice that, that, that you're struggling with patience, go to Jesus. Learn of Him. Be more like Him. Memorize verses about Jesus. And you will learn all of these things. But the ultimate is you will have life. And in the last day, He will raise you. And that's what will give your heart and soul satisfaction. And now put all this together, satisfaction. We, we all know what this is like on the side of eating and drinking. We sit down to eat after we, we've eaten enough. We all know what that feeling of being satisfied is. And we know we really shouldn't even pass that and overeat because we almost don't feel satisfied anymore. We start feeling kind of uncomfortable. But satisfaction means you have had Enough. You have everything you need. You're not going to go open the refrigerator and look for some goodies or the cabinet and look for some junk food. No, you are satisfied. And this is what Jesus is saying. Look at verse 35 again. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Isn't this a description of the world, of your heart and mind? We are hungry, thirsty people. And there are three things primarily that we hunger for and we thirst for. We hunger for love, even to love and to be loved. We hunger for cleansing and we hunger for hope. And let me end just speaking of these three and how in Jesus we are completely satisfied in all of these areas. The world wants love. But it seeks it in people. It seeks it in things. And never finds it. People disappoint them. And they disappoint people. The satisfaction never comes. Every single person in the whole world longs for cleansing. Because God has given all of us the gift of the conscience. The conscience is always reminding the heart that we are guilty. Every new sin, we feel the weight. And guilt is massive. It is weighty. It is what makes us sad. It is what makes us gloomy. We feel unclean. The conscience is a good gift because it's making us feel that we need to be saved, that we need salvation outside of ourselves. And when we are guided by God's word, we know it points to Jesus. But the way society goes is I, I want this delivered. If only you would accept me the way I am, I wouldn't feel guilty anymore. That's exactly what's happening in today's world. Stop judging me. Let me live the way I want. It's, it's a quest 
for a clear conscience. It's, it's a longing. And the way of the world in the past was I'll do it at, when nobody knows. That will make me not feel so guilty. But now the, the desire for doing things that in the past were very shameful is so great that now there's this focus in forcing people to accept my life and maybe that will make me not feel so guilty. It's a hunger. And the third hunger is this hunger, this longing for safety in the future. And not just the future after life, but also the future of tomorrow and the day after tomorrow and when I get older and, and, and yes, the afterlife. And there is this longing, there is this search, and, and, and there is this sense of what, what, what can I do? Will I be happy? This, this quest for hope is connected with the quest for joy. Now in Christ, you are satisfied completely for love because you'll be able to say, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. Beloved, think of it. When you know Jesus, you have met the one who has loved his own most than any lover in the whole entire world. So much that he gave his own life on the cross. He shed his blood for you. For you who would love him. And you would say, but my love is not complete. Yes, it isn't. And when you look to him and confess it, he's the one who will forgive you and cleanse you so that you can love him aright. And with the hope that in heaven you will, with no more flaws and no more sins. See, so even in relationships where you do feel the guilt that you're not loving your spouse as you ought, in loving Christ, that doesn't exist because he cleanses you, he forgives you, he pardons. It is what keeps a marriage alive. One loving the other, each loving the other, and each forgiving the other. And, and, but we're not perfect in doing this. But the more we do it the biblical way, the more the marriage endures. And, and the marriage to Christ, he will always forgive you, and you never need to forgive him. Because he's perfect. There's the love. And you're satisfied with love. And then cleansing. Well, we, we've spoken of this already. In, in Christ, you have the certainty that every single sin, no matter what corner in your life it is, if you put it before the Lord, if you say, Lord, forgive me, cleanse me. I hate sin. I want to be delivered. He does. This is why he came to the cross. To forgive sinners. Cleansing. So you find that in Christ, the satisfaction that your conscience is made clear. And then hope. Our souls are satisfied because we find love, we find cleansing, we find hope for this day and for the next, for this life and for the next. We know that tomorrow God will be sovereign still and the day after and if I leave this world to meet the Lord, He will receive me and I will be well. And then there's satisfaction. Have you come to Christ? Is Christ your portion? Is He your drink? Is He the one in whom your soul finds all satisfaction? He will raise you up in the last day if you come. And you will have eternal life. If you're not a believer, you must come. You must believe. You must eat and drink of Him. And if you are a believer, that is what you are to continue doing. In finding all your comfort in Him. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we... Thank Thee for having sent us Thy Son, who said He is the bread of life for us. Lord, we pray that we would be full of gratitude, that we would be full of joy, that we would come to Jesus, that we would believe in Him, that we would be satisfied in Him. Forgive us, Lord, for so often chasing after loves that do not love and Lord, forgive us for not loving Thee as we ought to love. And we thank Thee, Lord, for the cleansing power that flows from the cross of Christ. We pray, Lord, in the name of Christ. Amen.
we'll be closing with Psalter 30, and our doxology is number one, found in page 415. So Psalter 30 first. <clears throat> 